Um, so uh, before we get started, um, I, I'd like to welcome, we shall be joined by um, the Lord Speaker, Baroness D'Souza, but also um, to welcome our guests here today, very kindly agreed to join us. As we have Margaret Hodge MP, I'm very glad to have you here. Have you previously taken part in any Women in Parliament events? Probably, I think, done. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, and, yeah. and Baroness Young of Hornsey as well. So we've got representation for the House of Commons and the House of Lords, so it'll be interesting to sort of cover both those sides as well. OK, well, thank you. I'd like to welcome uh, Baroness de Souza, Lord Speaker of the House of Lords, um, to begin today's proceedings. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. 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 Thank you very much indeed. Uh, is, is it okay if I sit down? Yes. Well, normally I stand up, but um, that means I'm quite distant from my notes. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm sort of delighted to be here and indeed to see you at this sort of special event to commemorate women. Um, and in particular, what I want to talk about is women in politics, but quite briefly, because I think what's going to be much more interesting is if we actually have a dialogue uh, between us. Um, but women's participation in the political process is something which um, we all strive for. And if you sort of look at this table, this top table, you will see you know, distinguished women who are involved in politics. But that is not true for the world over, unfortunately, as yet. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has, as its preamble, a very moving phrase. And that phrase is, we the peoples of the United Nations, not we the governments of the United Nations, we the peoples of the United Nations. And it goes on to say, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war and to reaffirm faith in fundamental rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and nations large and small have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish these aims. And that is the sort of standard which actually was, was drafted after World War II. And the UN Declaration then goes on to list what those freedoms are. The Declaration, the UN Declaration on Human Rights and the many instruments which followed in the next 60 years or so, lists the basic freedoms to which we have a right, the right to life, liberty and security of the person, to freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and religion, and to political participation. Above all, the international instruments reiterate the universal truth that human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. So political participation has been, in fact, firmly established as a basic human right, the right to be involved in decisions which affect our lives and our livelihoods. And through the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Dis Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, which most of you will be familiar with, we have the international legal framework to enable women's political engagement to, to flourish. So the question becomes then, first of all, why does engagement matter? It's, it, I mean, very simply put, it's, it's, it's a complete necessity for, for any democracy to thrive, creating conditions that encourage Political partic participation is a crucial driver for achieving economic growth and establishing stable and successful societies. This we know to be true the world over. And this is not really because women have what you might call a unique view by virtue of our gender, but because without us, the political conversation is simply incomplete. Um, our democratic systems are at their most legitimate and most credible when there's engagement from all corners of society. Democracy is undermined when women are excluded. All this I know you know, but it is worth repeating every time. The instruments of politics, parliaments, governments, local councils, simply can't function as effectively uh, as they might in the absence of you know, one half of the, the population. And the benefits of female participation in public life is not limited only to politics. Studies have shown that uh, those businesses with a higher proportion of women on their boards perform better, and there are increasing studies which show that. And a 2014 study by Credit Suisse of 3,000 companies um, over two years found that those businesses with at least one woman on the board outperformed those with no women by an average of 5%. That said, there's a very recent report from the International Labour Organization said that the, um, the report looked at data from 178 countries and found that the rate of women's participation in the workforce was 25.5% lower than men's participation in 2015. 
a gap which is only 0.6% smaller than 20 years earlier. So how far have we progressed? And also, the kind of employment that women are engaged in often <coughs> is not of a quality that one would hope for. So uh, women's participation on an equal basis with men remains an aspiration rather than a fact for most of the world. And in 1990, the UN's Economic and Social Council recommended a target of 30% of women in leadership positions, not just in politics, by 1995, as a first step to complete you know, complete parity, 50-50 by the year 2000. But 25 years later, just 45 parliaments out of 190 worldwide currently meet that initial target. And, and I have to say that our parliament is not one of them. Um, following this uh, last year's general election, the House of Commons um, only just falls short. It's got, uh, 20, I think, 20, nearly 29%, is that right, Margaret? Nearly 29% women. 29.4. 29.4%, whereas we've only got 234 in the House of Lords, <coughs> which is interesting because we're an appointed House. So the question then becomes, what measures might the international community pursue to improve things? And to answer that question, it's, it's important to remember that women's political engagement is not an issue to be considered in isolation. It develops, of course, from the broader context of women's liberation and equality, from access to educational and to financial resources. In the less developed world, 70% of the world's poorest people are women. Too many women today still live in states of poverty, fear, exploitation, and utter weariness. Though political participation is undoubtedly their right, it is perhaps unrealistic to expect such women to aspire to political leadership, even at the local level when their primary concern remains subsistence and su survival. So the social conditions for political equality have first to be created. In an ideal world, girls go to school and they learn employment skills and ideally they take up dignified, thank you, dignified and rewarding work and ultimately become politically engaged at local, regional and even at national levels. And once enfranchised in this way, uh, they become democratic representatives themselves. And at this stage, that women's empowerment becomes transformative in bringing about permanent shifts in the distribution of social power. Now, in my experience, and I'm sure in others, these social conditions um, is, it are, are, in fact, uh, part of an ongoing, ongoing development uh, process. So I think what we have to do, if we are serious about trying to um, allow women to participate properly in politics, is to consider how best to support development around the world as a means of promoting women's political engagement. Um, and research in this area indicates that this is dependent on at least two principles, and this is something that I, I'm very keen on, on, on sort of reiterating because I've actually experienced it myself in, in, in the field in sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, South Asia. First of all, successful development focuses on what people actually need, not what donor organisations or governments or politicians would wish to give them. Secondly, initiatives that strengthen what already exists in the community, even if it's in embryonic form. These initiatives are much more likely to be sustained. And of course, the underlying, the underlying sentence, which I am not haven't uh, said, is that we can't impose anything on communities. It has to come, grow organically within communities. So the rationale here is that innovation is conceived and grown organically within the community and allows local leaders to emerge, become locally acceptable uh, mechanisms for monitoring and accountability to develop, and people to have a voice and a sense of ownership of the innovation that occurs in their communities. And this in turn means that any given project will be more likely to be nurtured within the community and defended if necessary, and existing structures within the community will be more likely to adapt, if not pressured to do so from the outside. And I'm, I was going to give you an example, but I'm very mindful of my time and the limits on my time. But very, very briefly, um, some years ago, immediately after the Taliban had been routed in Afghanistan, I was there as a governor for the uh, foundation, the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, to see what we could do. But to cut a very long story short, um, I came across a, a 
an experiment in an extremely remote community on the extreme west of Kabul, um, which had set up a school to educate girls and boys. And in fact, it was educating everything from seven to sort of 45, because during the Taliban years, everyone had been deprived of an education, but particularly women. And this school was in a bombed out mud structure because the whole place in that area of Western Kabul was the front line of the civil war and the war before that, the Russian occupation and the Taliban occupation, a very, very brutal time of some 30 years. And, uh, you know, one is inspired by certain things and I was particularly inspired by the charismatic leader of this and began to support him. And he had 30 students in three shifts in this tiny little room. I've got photographs of it, it's so crammed, you could hardly squeeze in, no windows, no roof, tarpaulin over the top. And, um, you know, 12, 10, 12 years later, it is a very major uh, school which has an international reputation. It has 4,000 pupils. It sends, it's half of which are girls, and it sends um, it sends most of the, them graduate and go to universities either in, in Afghanistan itself or in neighboring countries and a lot of them come to the UK as cheapening scholars or they go to the USA uh, and then they go back to Afghanistan so what we have is a sort of the ge a generation of potential and actual leaders who are now working in government and civil service in the, career, in, in, in the professions um, and what, the reason why I think this has succeeded beyond our expectations is um, because it was already there. It was a local development. It was something that the community had decided that they wanted and they supported, even though it took a lot of time to persuade parents to allow their girls to go to school because up until then it had been a very dangerous thing to do with the Taliban around. But I mean, bit by bit by bit, I've been supporting it. And indeed, there are many other people now, international donors who support it. But it is largely self-sustaining. And it is part of the community. It's rooted in the community. And this, to my mind, is an example of development that works. And again, it has those two essential ingredients. If you want to sort of promote women, you want to educate women, choose something that's already in the community. Um, and, and, and choose something that people themselves have, have, have chosen. Uh, they, 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 they wanted that school and they will defend that school and believe you me, um, that school needs defending because uh, you know the Taliban is a resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan and they don't like women, they don't like girls and they don't like education. Um, now, you know, but lots of uh, development programs, particularly those for women, fail. And they fail for all sorts of reasons, but I do think that one of the chief reasons why they fail is because they don't obey the sort of the, the fundamental laws, which are that, um, you know, where that one has to be very careful about respecting the intelligent choices that people make. People who have very scarce resources make intelligent choices because they have to. And we can, we can, we can make all sorts of choices. It doesn't mean we're going to fall through the, you know, the, the gap. But I think people um, in, in, in sort of marginal societies don't have that, um, um, don't have that luxury. Um, right, I think what I, I've skipped a page, so really what I need to do is to go back and actually talk about um, what's happening in political engagement and close to home, the experience of the House of Lords. Um, the major, which is, as you know, quite low, 23.4%. And as I said, I think referred to earlier, that in an appointed House one would expect that we should have parity by now. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know. Um, the major came, the change came in 1958 with the life Peerages Act, which means what it says on the tin, that for the first time, people could be appointed to the House of Lords without having any kind of a sort of uh, aristocratic background, people from you know, normal life, life that you and I uh, follow, they could be appointed to the House. And one would have thought that at that time, you know, they could have really um, you know, put a whole sort of wadge of women in, but they didn't. Um, the first female members were very much in the minority. And 10 years on from that, in 1969, 11 years afterwards, just 3% of the House were female. The number never rose above 5% until 1989. But in the subsequent 25 years, um, we've seen a great improvement. When I came to the House in 2004, there were just 17% of us, were there not, Lola? 17% um, um, yes. of us. And I'm <laughs> checking my <laughs> figures. Um, and now the figure is just, uh, just under 25%, which is um, a more optimistic way of saying 24.3%. Um, it's not enough, but things are changing. 
the benefits of greater female representation in the House are clear to see. Um, our female members have equipped the House to hold better informed debates on matters as wide-ranging as the role of women in sport, FGM, women's economic empowerment and domestic violence. But let me not uh, immediately say it's not just the so-called female issues that women deal with. We've got sort of women who represent the built environment, who represent defense, um, and, and, and obviously the professions law and medicine and science. So it's not just uh, that they sort of come in and they say, well, we're a woman, we're women, so therefore we, can only, we are the only ones who can talk about FGM. Nonsense, nonsense. FGM was, as, a, as an issue which should be prosecuted was introduced years ago by one particular peer in the House, Baroness Rendell, um, uh, Ruth Rendell, the crime writer, um, who was uh, adamant that this is a subject that should be tackled, should be looked at, should be prosecuted, should be made a criminal offence. And she went on and on and on. And every time Ruth stood up, everyone knew it was going to be about female genital mutilation. And then, you know, gradually over the years, and this is during my time there, um, we had a debate. I mean, Ruth very sadly died last year, but before she died, there was a debate where the majority of speakers were actually men, um, which in, in thinking about the House of Lords, which has a fairly aged profile of sort of, tend to be sort of white males of, of a very ancient age, you know, talking about female, was, is, is, is a thing to behold. Um, <laughs> and it, it, in a way, what was really great about it as well is that, you know, that there has now, there is now legislation on the statute books, which makes it illegal to be in any way involved in the, you know, the, the brutal, brutal task of female genital mutilation. And I don't know when any of you heard the news this morning, mm. but there was a couple that were stopped at the airport uh, on their way, I think, uh, to Nairobi, were they not, to Kenya, who mm. um, were suspected of being involved in taking a child in order to be mutilated. Um, so, I mean, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago, but, you know, that, that is something that Ruth did. Um, as a chamber of professional expertise, which the House of Lords tries to be, uh, many of our members are appointed to, to bring particular skills and experience garnered in the UK's boardrooms and workplaces. And um, our membership, I think, to some extent reflects the shortcomings and the gender balance of the private sector. And um, the fact that we don't have parity, 50-50 in the Lords, it means many things, or it's due to many things, but one of the things it's due to is because there are not enough women, perhaps, who have reached the tops of their professions as yet um, to be invited to be in the House of Lords. I'm not sure that's actually true. I think we could probably look a little bit harder, but um, you know, you can at least entertain that as a possibility. Um, One of, the, one of the ways in which we might deal with it in the, in the House of Lords, and it's something that a lot of us argue for a lot of the time, is that we should have a statutory appointments committee which, which, which looks at everyone who goes into the Lords and looks at them very hard and says, do you have the skills necessary? Do you have the ethnic, gender, you know, diversity uh, to contribute to the work of the House of Lords? so that it comes away from political patronage and becomes you know, a proper, well thought through recruitment process which actually furnishes the Lords with the skills it needs in order to scrutinize and revise legislation. Um, I want to just end on one last point, okay, which is that um, there is a very, one very um, encouraging example and it concerns the Women's Parliamentary Caucus in Pakistan. Pakistan's not a country in which you would have thought that women's liberation is something that we can all sort of stand up and shout about. But as it so happens, um, and again, there are lots of complicating factors, um, but there are a number of women um, uh, MPs in both houses in, in Pakistan, low, low and upper house. And the Women's Parliamentary Caucus is a very powerful body of about 100 uh, parliamentarians who some time ago got together in order to try to encourage more women to enter into the political process. Now, in Pakistan, I think it is also a, largely a matter of access to resources. It so happens that most of the women in Parliament are those who have a pretty wealthy background. Um, so it is not sort of your women from the village, but it is beginning to permeate now through provincial and local and district levels. And the idea is that these women got together and what they did 
was to act as a body and to strike down legislation which was on the statute books which was inimical to women and to promote women-friendly legislation onto, onto, onto the books and to support women and to understand more about how to create um, it, it political confidence, as it were, at the more local level, working at provincial and local levels. They have quite sort of uh, large provincial uh, governments. And that is working incredibly well, and I've been involved with that now for about five, six years, and indeed I'm going out again very shortly to talk to this, uh, this caucus and to try to replicate that in other countries within South Asia, um, Afghanistan and, and, and India, Nepal and, and um, uh, Bangladesh and, and Sri Lanka. And uh, it's beginning It's beginning to happen. And I think more than anything else, what these women in the Parliamentary Caucus are trying to do is to provide a model for other women. It is to say it is possible, you can do it. Um, because I think that, again, is something that is very, very important. Um, I'm, I'm sure others are going to talk about what's been happening here, but mostly what's been happening here in Parliament has been happening in the House of Commons. Um, and uh, there's been some extraordinary work done uh, with the result of setting up um, a parliamentary body which actually promotes women and indeed produces a report which had recommendations as to how one can make parliament more women friendly, um, less abusive language, zero tolerance response to unprofessional behavior in the chamber, making the timetabling more family friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, how can we ensure that we continue to move closer to equal representation of women in politics? And how can you perhaps work on that? And the most obvious way is to make clear to your elected representatives, whoever they might be, that you want them to represent the entire population, not just half of it, to engage in the political process. And again, I keep saying to everyone I talk to that you know the political process is not just what happens in Westminster. It's what happens every day in your neighborhood, on the road, in your local council, in local schools, in Parent Teachers Association. All that is politics. It's getting, gathering people together to make representation and to change things. So engage in the political process and don't take your democratic institutions for granted. Choose politicians who can be not just lawmakers, but um, public opinion shapers. And what I think I will say as a last point is that um, we can't duck it any longer. I mean, I keep sort of saying we're at tipping point because there's so much that has happened in the last 25, 30, 40 years. There's so much awareness. There's so many women's groups. There's so many people working at the individual level. Have we reached the tipping point? Have we got critical mass? I think we do, but we're not coordinating sufficiently. And I think that you know, if we were to act in one voice in some way, then I think we would probably be a lot more per powerful. It is up to all of us to make the change. Um, if your elected representatives won't take this on, then do it yourselves. Become a parliamentarian, for heaven's sake. It's easy peasy. Um, <laughs> strike down legislation inimical to women. Promote laws which allow women to be the driving force for economic growth. No one is going to do it for you. We have to do it ourselves. So that's my final message to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Baroness Susan. Thank you, the Lord Speaker, um, for joining us this afternoon. I'm afraid you do have to head off at 2.30. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. <laughs> um, but we'll be continuing the event now, um, firstly with a few words from um, Margaret Hodge MP and then afterwards from Baroness Young. Um, so roughly by about 3pm um, we're going to start the, the Q&A, um, so bear in mind those questions then. I think I'll pass over to... Okay, well I'm going to stand up because I can't see you. So. <laughs> um, right, well, uh, I'm the 166th ever woman MP. Isn't that shocking? And I've been here for over 20 years. And when I was first elected as an MP, there were more uh, MPs whose first name was John than there were women members of parliament. Uh, even when we look today, uh, the Labour Party is doing rather better than the Conservative Party, actually, on MPs. We've got about 40% of our, our representatives are MPs, where the Conservative Party is just over 20%. Uh, so, but we're both useless, and there's absolutely no reason whatsoever that uh, there shouldn't be more. Uh, the only thing I like to think is we're doing slightly better than other professions, 
the newspaper industry, only f less than 5% of editors, that must mean about one or two when you look at these mm. percentages, are women. Judges, less than one in four is a woman, with one or two trying to get <coughs> up there. So right across the thing, we, we're, we've got miles and miles to go. Now, when I first came here, I'm going to regale you with all sorts of stories, really, because when I first came here, I couldn't find the loo. I couldn't mm -hmm. find the women's loo. There were plenty of men's loo. Very few women's loos, because there were very few women MPs. And the only iron and ironing board in the whole of the Palace <laughs> of Westminster was in the women's loo. Um, and it sort of, it, it felt like that all the way through. And I think one of the things I'd say is, actually, the challenges I face are going to be the challenges you face and the challenges we all face at women, and that is balancing our lives between all the various bits of our lives. Um, I've got four children. I've now proudly got 11 grandchildren, uh, and they are all really important to me. But balancing between caring for that, you don't all have, I know people may have elderly parents they've got to, they've got to care for, but ba doing that balance between caring and uh, uh, realizing yourself in your life is always difficult. So I always tell this story, was when I first was elected, Tony Blair had just become leader of the Labour Party. He wasn't yet then even Prime Minister. And I don't know if you ever watch Prime Minister's Questions on telly, but you know, you see the person sitting behind the, pri the Prime Minister or the leader of the opposition. And I thought, the good people of Barking, which is the constituency I represent, needed to see me behind Tony Blair to show that I was really working hard on their behalf. But to get that seat behind your leader, you had to get into the chamber about an hour before P Prime Minister's <laughs> question started. So I religiously went in, sat behind, um, sat behind Tony and thought, this is great, they'll all see me embarking and know that I'm really representing them here in the house. PMQ started, and in those days we didn't even have these mobiles, we had pagers. And my pager suddenly went off, and my uh, third daughter was at home uh, studying for her GCSEs, and I, it had on it, ring home crisis. And I thought, sugar, what's happened? Uh, has she set fire to the house? Is she going to tell me she's pregnant? I didn't know what to expect. So I rushed out to ring her up, losing my place behind Tony Blair. Got on the phone, said to her, what's the matter, Anna? And she said, oh, Mum, I just wanted to see whether you had the silences on or off on your pager. <laughs> <laughs> so I lost my place and didn't get anywhere. But I've spent my life, all my, I've been in sort of politics, both at local government and, and at central government level for over 40 years, and I've always been a feminist. I'm proud to call myself <coughs> a feminist and always fought for uh, um, feminist causes. And women can make a difference. I mean, I, I was on a local authority, a London council for 20 years, and I remember we really had to battle. It was when I had little babies. And if you've got a baby, being at home at about 6.30, 7 o'clock at night is really important just to be able to settle them and put them to bed. And, of course, all the meetings started in the town hall at about 6.37. And all the boys wanted to go off and have a pint of beer, so they wanted the meetings to start early. And we literally had a three-year fight to persuade people that actually they should put the start back of their meeting to 7.30. So it's quite, it took us at that time, you know, just a very simple diff thing which made all the difference about women with young children being able to participate in politics at the local level, which is a very satisfying place to do it. The other thing is, I remember we, this is going, this early 80s, mid 80s, so it's a long time ago, but we introduced two things as a council. We were Labour Council. One was we said, um, um, we introduced childcare facilities for our staff. That was considered absolutely bonkers. We were, we were accused of totally wasting um, in, uh, ratepayers' money, profligacy, all that sort of stuff. But actually, it was really important. It helped those <coughs> few women that we could to uh, both work and you know, make sure that their children were being well cared for. And of course, today it's become commonplace. So very often, the, I tell, the reason I tell that story is that things that you do, uh, which are often considered radical and difficult at one point, then become commonplace afterwards. So there's things that you can change. There are other things that I get rather depressed about that I think I've changed in my political life and haven't. So for example, when I started in the world of work, 
you didn't get any entitlement to maternity leave. It was just awful. In fact, one of my friends, and we didn't have anything like that, that, was made to work. She worked for Unilever. She was made to work up to the, almost the point she was in labour and was then rung up and told, you're either back in two weeks or your job's gone. And I thought we'd <coughs> won all that and it was all different now and people had their maternity rights and it was all strongly embedded. And now my children are having children and there's sort of three shocking stories there. So one of my daughters works uh, for a local authority and they tried to uh, make her redundant when she was on maternity leave, which was shocking. Uh, my daughter-in-law, so that's public sector, my daughter-in-law worked for a, one of the major law firms and they gave her an offer she couldn't refuse the day before she had her baby. So they basically got rid of her so that they wouldn't have her uh, back on the books. And my niece, so that's a private sector, my niece works for a voluntary organisation and she's had to have IVF treatment and they sacked her because she had too much time off to have her IVF treatment. So what that says to me is although you think you made progress, you can never take your foot off the accelerator and you've always got to ensure that those advances, small steps that you've made, the small advances you've made um, are uh, sustained. Now what about here in Parliament? I think the really important thing for women is we support each other uh, and we do that across the political divide there are different ways that we've come here I, want to, I will talk a little bit about that but I'm always really conscious you know we, we are, we're all colleagues together in Parliament and although we may totally disagree on you know public expenditure or Europe or gay marriage or any of these issues you can still work together quite collaboratively and be supportive and I think women's networks getting together on occasions like this is absolutely vital if we've got any chance whatsoever of trying to advance uh, the cause of equality. So I remember Justin Greening, who is now the uh, uh, in the cabinet on overseas development. When she, just after the 2010 election, when the coalition first got in, she was on the treasury, she was a junior minister in treasury, and she got up and she answered questions. It's quite scary when you're first a minister and you're put on, you, you get up to the dispatch box and you get these questions hauled at you. She answered without a bit of paper in front of her, and that was really impressive, and she did it really competently and confidently. And so very easily, I went up to her after and said, that was brilliant, although I didn't agree with the word she said. But she performed brilliantly, and I think that's really important. And when uh, David Cameron, as he did, got rid of a lot of women in his cabinet, um, including Caroline Spellman, just going up and saying to her, I'm really sorry you lost your job, is a very supportive thing to do. And I think there's a lot of that mutual uh, support um, uh, 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 across the piece, which I think is really, really, really important. Um, but uh, this place is still a very macho place. It's still a very hard place for women to see the whole way in which uh, politics, that we do the business of politics, just doesn't encourage women. So I don't actually ever go into, if I'm allowed to say it, into Prime Minister's questions because I can't stand it. I can't stand that sort of... Uh, in, where people shout at each other and uh, uh, it's just it's sort of it's such a little you know school schoolboy battle really rather than an intelligent engagement about issues that count now I've, I've told the Americans things it's love terrific fun when they watch it on um, uh, uh, on the on the telly but it just doesn't seem to me serious engagement whereas where I think I helped a lot and got things when I chaired one of the select committees because we were more collaborative, because we worked across, because we tried to build consensus, all those skills that women have. I think we got much further in really representing our, our, our constituents' interests and in furthering the issues that should be at the heart of politics, whatever the values that inform uh, your politics. So I find it really hard that the way that we do politics now is still difficult. I think what Labour has done is hugely important about getting more, because the only way you'll change it is by getting more women here. And we have had that, we've been successful. And that is because we've had those, the positive action um, uh, mechanisms within the <coughs> Labour Party. So half the seats that come up for where we're selecting candidates, where we know it's a pretty safe, safe Labour seat and they'll return a Labour, a Labour MP, half of those seats have to be all women's shortlists. 
Now, when we first introduced every, that, everybody said, oh, it's not going to lead to, you know, it's going to lead to second-rate people coming in. I can just tell you two things. One, we've got the most brilliant bunch of young women on the, uh, in the Labour in the Labour group, in the Parliamentary Labour Party now, who I think will go far and achieve a lot. And many of them came in through the all-women shortlist, but they've got a fantastic... They outperformed the boys, the men, so often that um, I don't apologise for that. And the other thing just to say to you is actually in those seats where we didn't have an all-women's shortlist, women could have been selected. So there was nothing to prevent women coming forward in that way. Not one woman came through from that. So if we hadn't had the positive action mechanism, we wouldn't achieve where we are now at 42%. And I don't think any of the other parties will get anywhere until, sadly, we take positive action uh, uh, for a um, period of time. The other thing to say is that um, having a, a strong group of women is really important and can really influence policy. So I, I was very privileged to be a, a member of Tony Blair's and Gordon Brown's government uh, during those years of the, the 13 years of Labour uh, being in government. And we just really made a difference. So let me give you two examples there. When tax credits were first introduced, whatever people think about them now, they were an attempt to try and redistribute wealth from richer families to poor, poorer families. Now, Gordon Brown wanted to put them into the wallet, so the man got it in his wage packet. And it was a battle from the women MPs that said to him, it mustn't go into the wallet, it's got to go into the purse, it's got to go to the mother. It was all about supporting children in the family rather than going into the, uh, into, in, 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 into the men's pay packet. And we succeeded. And we wouldn't have done that if there hadn't been a bunch of women um, at the heart of government uh, arguing the case on that. And the thing that I really know would never have happened, which I think has made the most dramatic difference in women's lives, is the introduction of uh, 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 flexible working, the right to request flexible working, which I think is probably one of the most important changes that we introduced in the Labour government. And when we started talking about that, both Gordon Brown and Tony Blair were completely and utterly and totally opposed to it. Uh, uh, because they thought it would upset business, because they thought business could, couldn't handle it. And it was because of the sustained, absolutely sustained pressure from about 10 of us here in Parliament who were all ministers, plus women who were working in Number 10 and uh, with uh, in, uh, supporting the Prime Minister, and women working in Number 11 supporting the Chancellor. All of us just ganging up, working together, plotting together, we actually, in the end, persuaded them to do it. And interestingly enough, now it's become commonplace, and of course, uh, in 85 or 90% of cases where people request the right of flexible working, it's granted, and it probably helps businesses do better because it keeps in the business women who might otherwise not be able to cope with both working and their caring responsibilities in the home. So those are two examples of where um, it's worked well. An example of where it's working badly uh, Jeremy Corbyn now has very has hardly any women at the top of his uh, tree. He talks about the women he has in the shadow cabinet, but actually the key people who are influencing his direction aren't there aren't women. So we got this disastrous um, thing about uh, prostitution the other day, uh, where I think he just didn't understand it because there weren't any women around him. This was about that we should decriminalise um, prostitution. Whereas, of course, most women, I mean, I can't think of many prostitutes who do it for the, you know, as a career. Most of them are forced in, most of them are locked into drug addiction or, 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 or poverty of some, uh, 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 addiction of some kind. And if you, what we should be really doing is having an offence against the men who pay, who choose to pay, who, who try to pay for sex. And so the whole concept of decriminalising that was so wrong. And I don't put it down to his ill will or his uh, 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 wickedness. I think he just uh, wasn't um, surrounded uh, uh, by women. Um, so I think the final thing I want to say is this, <coughs> that the important thing for women, I think, you know, for heaven's sake, get involved in politics. It's really important. It has impacts on your life, whether it's at a local level, whether it's at uh, lo uh, you know in your community, 
in your local authority, uh, in your school, wherever it is, what you do has an impact on your life and your family's life. So it's really, really important. But for me, and I say this a lot to the young women, our lives aren't a short sprint. So you don't have to succeed. If you see these young men floating away and doing really, really well at 30, you know, when they come in at 25, 30, don't think that you have to do it all then. There are times in your life where you won't absolutely push forward, you know, where you will want to balance looking after babies, looking after elderly relatives, whatever it is, with the rest of your life. And you can actually just stay on at, uh, at one level because it, you don't have to achieve it all today. You're all going to probably work till you're 80, believe it, which is a good thing because you're going to live till you're 100 plus. So you've got a long, 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 long life in front of you. It's a big marathon. And in your marathon, you can succeed. I didn't come into Parliament till I was 50 uh, because, uh, uh, because of my four children. You know, I, I always worked, but I didn't. And a lot of my contemporaries in local government came in before me. But I was here at 50, and I'm now over in my 70s, and I like to think that uh, I've just had the most successful five years of my professional uh, career in my late 60s and early 70s, and I've still got a heck of a lot of things I want to achieve. So it is a long marathon, not a short sprint. Actually, women are probably better at uh, 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 succeeding in that marathon, and we do need you here. So please come and join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret Hodge MP. Um, when you were commenting, you know, Parliament has a long way to go. I was looking around the room and noticing all the male portraits, actually, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, around the room. So, yeah, not really representative, maybe, with the artwork in the room either. Um, so, just for our second uh, talk now, I'd like to welcome uh, Baroness Young. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. OK, I'm going to go back to 1958. As um, Baroness de Souza said earlier, that was the year when the House of Lords finally decided that it was OK for women to participate. And me, I, I was actually alive in 1958. Some of you in this room uh, uh, were too. And I sort of think back to those days. You know, often we see those Sue Rosie colored spectacles. I don't myself, but I do remember some of the images from that time, the kind of very stiff ramrod, you know, sort of presenters of children's television would not be sort of funky and relaxed and in casual clothes like they are today. The Shadows, I think, was the nearest we came to a boy band singing with Cliff Richard and the kind of hysteria that surrounded them. And uh, uh, the first James Bond um, book, Dr. No, was published. And um, coming out meant uh, referred to debutantes coming out from, <laughs> you know, into womanhood from their cloistered aristocratic beginnings. <laughs> so that was 1958. But it's so interesting because a little while ago, a little while ago, I did a bit of research for a lecture on women in the House of Lords from 1958. So here are some comments uh, from. Um, uh, members of the Lords, which was all hereditaries and therefore all male at the time. So uh, one Earl found that, I quote, women in politics, highly distasteful. In general, they are organising, they are pushing, and they are commanding. And I think, so what's the problem? You know, if, if you're a man, that's the, that, those are really good qualities, but not for a woman. He said, the very thought of a female lady chancellor, whew, because it's a Lord Chancellor, right, not a Lady Chancellor, was horrifying and enabled women to infiltrate this kind of robust, unemotional world of male politics. So he said to do such a thing as that would be to encourage them to, and I quote, eat their way like acid into metal, into positions of trust and responsibility which previously men have held. And I think that's where, you know, that's the crux of the matter. It's this idea that this monstrous regiment of women will come along and displace every male in the institution. When I was an academic, I remember this the other day, when I was an academic, I remember a fellow um, academic male saying, oh, God, the place is being taken over by young women lecturers in miniskirts. So I thought, well, you wish, because actually, <laughs> you know, there's no sign of that anywhere. I, I, I was sort of looking and thinking, where, where are you seeing this? We're obviously looking at the world through totally different spectacles. 
And in a way, that leads me into the theme of what I want to say, which is around that thing of personal being political. Because I know a lot of people are kind of put off of this idea of this robust world of politics where people stand up and make gestures and shout and scream at each other. And, you know, even in the Lords, where we're more polite, it can still be a little bit of a bear pit. So, you know, that's very off-putting to people. I don't come from a party political background at all. For me, it was always about, well, what, those things, what were those things that I saw in my childhood? I saw images on television of black people getting beaten up in South Africa. I saw images of black people getting beaten up in uh, the USA. I saw images of uh, women being, or oh, hardly any images of women in, in the 1950s and 60s on television. And as for that idea of um, identifying with role models on television, whether they be black or uh, female, that just wasn't on the agenda at all. Then it was those kinds of things that I thought about more and more as I got older and when I was involved in the arts I saw these same kinds of things being replicated there people talk about the arts as being very tolerant and very liberal and open and inclusive it's just the same as anywhere else so again there were these exclusions there were these pigeonholes these ways of stigmatizing and stereotyping people which dictated and then I was an actor dictated the kind of roles you could play so I was active in the actors union called equity for all, all the time that I acted I didn't really think of that as being politics because to me it was about fairness it was about equality it was about work you know I couldn't get work other than as a nurse or a prostitute um, you know it was this kind of crazy world where where TV executives thought that you couldn't have a black person as a bank manager because that would be absolutely too disruptive so all of these kinds of things made me think all the way through my working life about my positioning in society and what what could I do for myself and for others like me who found themselves in this position? I should also say that I was in care, and that was that was a very um, defining experience for me. Not defining in sense of um, how I feel about myself, but in terms of shaping. Maybe shaping rather than defining is. Um, uh, is a better term. Shaping my worldview. So into that mix of. Um, uh, concerns about gender representation, race representation, came that whole thing about how do we treat people, particularly children, who come from difficult backgrounds, who've had difficult um, uh, situations to deal with in their lives. What happens to them when they're looked after by the so-called corporate parent and what happens to them after they've left that, that parent? So all of those kinds of issues, as I say, were kind of swirling around when Tony Blair's government brought in this idea of the much maligned people's peers. Now, I can understand why it was kind of trashed in a way. It's really trashed because of the class system here, in my view, which I remember people saying, well, people's peers, what does that mean? Does that mean you could have, say, a, a hairdresser as a, as a member of the House of Lords? And so, again, I would think, well, why? What's the problem with that? Well, it's because, you know, there's a certain kind of status, a certain way of looking at people and thinking about people's place in the world. And for many, even still today, being a member of the House of Lords has a certain kind of cachet, prestige, status, which should be accorded to certain kinds of individuals. And I'm sorry that Frances D'Souza isn't still here, because I'd like to have a little bit of a ding-dong with her about as to why there aren't more women in the House of Lords, because I think it's disgraceful that in an appointed... Mm, I mean, we've got yeah. hardly any legitimacy as it is, because we're not elected, but then to have an appointed uh, chamber with less women than the elected chamber, that is absolutely disgraceful. And it's not only the political parties. I have to say, I was ashamed when I was doing some research the other day to find the um, ratios for the different groups in the, in the House of Lords as of 12th of October 2015. 201 female members of the House of Lords. That's out of about 850. So um, Conservative, there's 22% of the group are women. Liberal Democrat, 35% of the group are women. Labour, 31% of the group are women. And bottom of the pile, crossbenchers, 21% of the group.
group and I, I just fail to understand this I'm going to pursue this because we have a House of Lords Appointments Commission that's specifically been set up okay it hasn't got royal status but that doesn't prevent it from looking at the overall balance and this is not about diluting you know the meritocracy um, uh, of, of, of the House of Lords I should put meritocracy in uh, inverted commas whilst I'm having a rant because <laughs> it isn't all about that as, as Francis said there's too much by way of political patronage that still goes on mm -hmm. in, in, in the House of Lords but you know we have an opportunity on the cross benches all cross benches are appointed by a commission you apply for it like a job you fill in a form you have interviews so how come it's not possible to get a better balance there's very few ethnic minorities in the cross benches as well so again this is an issue where we have to keep working at it and i guess i sort of called this talk women's work because you know when i was growing up it's oh women's work is never done and that always meant you know dusting cleaning cooking and all of those domestic duties but that bigger work that we as women have to do that's that's where we've really got to concentrate um our efforts i think in terms of one of the things that i used to do as an academic was look at the representation of different groups the ways in which they were presented to us whether that be on television on in, the, in other parts of the media this was all before social media uh, came about and in some ways I'm quite glad that I don't have to trawl through loads of trolling twi tweets in order to uh, uh, demonstrate how women are treated in the public domain but there's always one example that always stands out to me that I mention I talked about this with a group of girls at school the other day how in 2002 when Theresa May was at the Conservative Party conference. All I could find about what happened after that conference regarding her was a picture of her shoes. Because she wore a pair of shoes that had this kind of sort of faux animal print on them. And there were loads of images of these kind of neat little kitten-heeled pointy shoes. I thought, well, what's that got to do with the Home Secretary precisely? You know, I don't see the same kind of focus on male shoes. Perhaps it's just as well looking at some of them. Um, uh, some people's but there you go um no but this, this sort of focus on the way in which you present yourself now i'm not saying that that's not important and also i would kind of defend saying yeah sometimes women are more preoccupied with the way they look because partly because it actually can be quite pleasurable you know dressing up and doing that so i don't think we need to feel in a position of having to deny difference but by the same token, it's the weight that's accorded to these particular um, practices that, that's important. I mean, I do think some of the positive, really positive things about the House of Lords, first of all, it's, it's a place where older women can have a bit of authority and gravitas and find a space to speak. You know, and as you get older, most of you are very young here, in my eyes at any rate. And it's like, you know, but as you get older, there, there is this kind of invisibilization process that goes on you're kind of not there or you're there and you're in the way and you shouldn't have anywhere to, to, to where you can speak so that's a good it's a good place and there are many examples of older women who are totally fluent totally on top of their subject on a range of subjects and really are a good example to us all um i remember also that one of the things that that um has been a constant in my 12 years in the House of Lords is that people will say they think somehow that there are more women in the House of Lords than there are. So people will tell you, oh, there's a much higher proportion of, of women in the House of Lords than there are in, in the Commons. But as I've already said, that's not the case. However, it is the case that women do tend to have more leadership roles in the House of Lords, perhaps. And that means that the visibility is, is, seen, is greater. And I think there's a, very, uh, there's a level on which there really um, there are more women because some of the research seems to say that more women attend more regularly than men. Now, you know, there is uh, that sort of thing of getting down to the business, getting on with the work. In the past, and I think still to some extent today, the House of Lords is treated like it's an old gentleman's club. And that is, you know, that is, there is a, a really strong truth to that. If you look around um, the dining rooms and the guest rooms and all the rest of it, you can see that there's still that kind of um, shadow of, 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 of that situation there. I'm not saying women don't sit around and talk and eat and drink and all the rest of it, but a lot of 
women do really get on with the job. In my time, we've had two Lord Speakers, they've both been women. Um, I think three of the four leaders of the house that I've seen have been women. Uh, there's women on the front bench and so on and so forth, across again, across a variety of subjects. So I suppose, um, sort of as I sort of come to a conclusion, I would say this, this issue of change, things do change. And again, when I was talking about this the other day, I used an example from popular culture because I still have an interest in that area. And I remember thinking with Sigourney Weaver in Alien in 1979, some of you may have seen that film either at the time or later. And I remember women, friends coming back from seeing that movie and saying, oh my God, it's really good for women. And you know, all because there's the woman survivor and she's strong, she's clever, she's intelligent and all the rest of it. And she holds center stage. And of course the alien itself is female, very powerful, even though evil uh, character. <laughs> but then I thought, you know, so there's, there's a bit of continuity here. So, so with regard to Sigourney Weaver, then she was in Ghostbusters, of course, although she had a rel relatively minor um, role. So Ghostbusters, the, all the males, all the different kinds of masculinity you can think of, they're sort of encapsulated in these stereotypes. And then now, in 2016, we have an all-female group of um, Ghostbusters. Now, that might seem sort of like a trivial thing, but actually, these kinds of things, in my view, are really quite important because there's this really interesting and complex sort of interchange between what society is or is seen to be or is thought of as being, the ways in which politicians and other opinion formers and opinion shapers think society is and what society can take. There's us who are in society and we know what we can take and what changes and what progress we are able to see. And so, you know, you get sometimes in popular culture, you get these kinds of just this sort of scent of a little bit of a movement in a slightly different direction. And so for me, I think politicians would do well to take note of that and to understand that, um, that if we are truly to represent, it's the simplest calculation that we have. If we start talking about representation of ethnic minorities and religions and other kind of uh, areas where there's much discrimination, it gets quite complicated. But with women, it's very simple. 50% of the population, more or less women, 50% men. So representation is a kind of easy calculation. And I think I'll end there. Okay, thank you very much.